Good evening, Larson leaders, and welcome back to Bedtime Stories with Mrs. Schatzko. As you know, we are reading Where the Red Fern Grows, and this is chapter two. We will get started. Oh, I forgot to tell you, in our literacy challenge tonight, I chose to read while wrapped in a blanket. I've got my big squishy Idaho blanket here that I love to sit and read in, and um, this is where I always sit to read. So I'm sharing it with you all. Chapter two. I suppose there is a time in practically every young boy's life when he is affected by that wonderful disease of puppy love. I don't mean the kind of the boy a boy has for the pretty little girl that lives down the road. I mean the real kind, the kind that has four small feet and a wiggly tail and sharp little teeth that can gnaw on a boy's finger. The kind of boy can, can romp and play with, even eat and sleep with. I was 10 years old when I first became infected with this terrible disease. I'm sure no boy in the world has had it worse than I did. It's not easy for a young boy to want a dog and not be able to have one. It starts gnawing on his heart and gets all mixed up in his dreams. It gets worse and worse until finally it becomes almost unbearable. If my dog wanting had been that of an ordinary boy, I'm sure my mother and father would have gotten me a puppy, but my wants were different. I didn't want just one dog, I wanted two. And not just any kind of dog, they had to be a special kind and a special breed. I had to have some dogs. I went to my father and had a talk with him. He scratched his head and thought it over. Well, Billy, he said, I heard that old man Hatfield's collie is gonna have pups. I'm sure I can get one of them for you. He may as well have poured cold water on me. Papa, I said, I don't want an old collie dog. I want hounds, coon hounds, and I want two of them. I could tell by the look on his face that he wanted to help me, but couldn't. He said, Billy, those kinds of dogs cost money, and that's something we don't have right now. Maybe someday when we can afford it, you can have them, but not right now. I didn't give up. After my talk with Papa, I went to Mama. I fared no better there. Right off, she said, I was too young to be hunting with hounds. Besides, a hunter needed a gun, and that was one thing I couldn't have, not until I was 21 anyway. I couldn't understand it. There I was, sitting right in the middle of the finest hunting country in the world, and I didn't even have a dog. Our home was in a beautiful valley far back in the rugged Ozarks. The country was new and sparsely settled. The land we lived on was Cherokee land, allotted to my mother because of the Cherokee blood that flowed in her veins. It lay in a strip from the foothills of the mountains to the banks of the Illinois River in northeastern Oklahoma. The land was rich, black, and fertile. Papa said it would grow hair on a crosscut saw. He was the first man to stick the cold steel point of a turning plow into the virgin soil. Mama had picked the spot for our log house. It nestled at the edge of the foothills in the mouth of a small canyon and was surrounded by a grove of huge red oaks. Behind our house, one could see miles and miles of the mighty Ozarks. In the spring, the aromatic scent of wildflowers, red buds, pawpaws, and dogwoods drifting on the wind currents spread over the valley and around our home. Below our fields, twisting and winding, ran the clear blue waters of the Illinois River. The banks were cool and shady, the rich bottom land near the river was studded with tall sycamores, birches, and box elders. To a 10-year-old boy, it was the most beautiful place in the whole wide world, and I took advantage of it all. I roamed the hills and the river bottoms. I knew every game trail in the thick cane breaks and every animal track that pressed in the mud along the riverbanks. The ones that fascinated me the most were the baby-like tracks of a river coon. I'd lie for hours examining them. Before leaving, I'd take a switch and sweep them all away. These I called my trail looks. The next day, I'd hurry back and sure enough, nine times out of 10, there in the clean, clean swept ground, I would again find the tracks of a ringtail coon. I knew he had passed over the trail during the night. I could close my eyes and almost see him, humped up and waddling along, fishing under the banks with his delicate little paws for crawfish, frogs, and minnows. I was a hunter from the time I could walk. 
I caught lizards on the rail fences, rats in the corn crib, and frogs in the little creek that ran through the fields. I was a young Daniel Boone. As the days passed, the dog wanting disease grew worse. I began to see dogs in my sleep. I went back to my father and mother. It was the same old story. Good hounds cost money and they just didn't have it. My dog wanting became so bad I began to lose weight and my food didn't taste good anymore. Mama noticed this and she had a talk with Papa. You're gonna have to do something, she said. I never saw a boy grieve like that. It's not right, just not right at all. I know, said Papa, and I feel just as badly as you do, but what can we do? You know we don't have that kind of money. I don't care, said Mama. You've got to do something. I can't stand to see him cry like that. Besides, he's getting to be a problem. I can't get my work done. He follows me around all day long, begging for hounds. I offered to get him a dog, said Papa, but he doesn't want just any kind of dog. He wants hounds, and they cost money. Do you know what the Parker boys paid for those two hounds they bought? $75. If I had that much money, I'd buy another mule. I sure do need one. I had overheard this conversation from another room. At first, it made me feel pretty good. At least I was getting to be a problem. Then I didn't feel so good. I knew my mother and father were poor and didn't have any money. I began to feel sorry for them and myself. After thinking it over, I figured out a way to help. Even though it was a great sacrifice, I told Papa I had decided I didn't want two hounds. One would be enough. I saw the hurt in his eyes and it made me feel like someone was squeezing water out of my heart. Papa set me on his lap and we had a good talk. He told me how hard times were and that it looked like a man couldn't get a fair price for anything he raised. Some of the farmers had quit farming and were cutting railroad ties so they could feed their families. If things didn't get better, that's what he'd have to do. He said he'd give anything if he could get some good hounds for me, but there didn't seem to be any way he could right then. I went off to bed with my heart all torn up in little pieces and cried myself to sleep. The next day, Papa had to go to the store. Late that evening, I saw him coming back. As fast as he could, as I could, I ran to meet him, expecting a sack of candy. Instead, he handed me three small steel traps. If Santa Claus himself had come down out of the mountains, reindeer and all, I would not have been more pleased. I jumped up and down and cried a whole bucket full of tears. I hugged him and told him what a wonderful papa he was. He showed me how to set them by mashing the spring down with my foot and how to work the trigger. I took them to bed with me that night. The next morning, I started trapping around the barn. The first thing I caught was Sammy, our house cat. If this didn't cause a commotion, I didn't. I didn't intend to catch him. I was trying to catch a rat, but somehow he came nosing around and got in my trap. My sister started bawling and yelling for mama. She came running, wanting to know what in the world was going on. None of us had to tell her. Sammy told her with his spitting and squalling. He was mad. He couldn't understand what that thing was that was biting his foot and he was making an awful fuss about it. His tail was as big as a wet corn cob and every hair on his small body was sticking straight up. He spit and yowled and dared anyone to get close to him. My sisters yelled their fool heads off all the time saying, oh, poor Sammy, poor Sammy. Mama shushed them up and told me to go get the forked stick from under the clothesline. I ran and got it. Mama was the best helper a boy ever had. She put the forked end over Sammy's neck and pinned him to the ground. It was bad enough for the trap to be biting his foot, but to have his neck pinned down that way was too much. He threw a fit. I never heard such a racket in all my life. If it wasn't long until everything on the place was all spooked up, the chicken started cackling and flew away up on the hillside. Daisy, our milk cow, all but tore the barn lot up and refused to give any milk that night. Sloppy Ann, our hog, started running in circles, squealing and grunting. Sammy wiggled and twisted. He yowled and spit, but it didn't do him any good. Mama was good and stout. She held him down tight to the ground. I ran in and put my foot on the trap spring, mashed it down and released his foot. With one loud squall, he scooted under the barn. After it was all over, Mama said, I don't think you'll have any more trouble with that cat. I think he's learned his lesson. How wrong Mama was. Sammy was one of those nosy kinds of cats like every other cat.
I'm sure. If you have kitties, you know they are nosy, nosy, and get into all kinds of trouble. Um, Sammy was one of those nosy kinds of cats. He would lie up on the red oak limbs and watch every move I made. I found some slick little trails out in our garden under some tall hollyhocks, thinking they were game trails and not knowing they were Sammy's favorite hunting trails, I set my traps. Sammy couldn't understand what I was doing out there, messing around his hunting territory. He went to investigate. It wasn't long until I had him limping with all four feet. Every time Papa saw Sammy lying around in the warm sun with his feet wrapped up in turpentine rags, he would laugh until big tears rolled down his cheeks. Mama had another talk with Papa. She said he was gonna have to say something to me because if I caught that cat one more time, it would drive her out of her mind. Papa told me to be more careful where I set my traps. Papa, I said, I don't want to catch Sammy, but he's the craziest cat I ever saw. He sees everything I do and just has to go sniffing around. Papa looked over at Sammy. He was lying all sprawled out in the sunshine with all four paws bandaged and sticking straight up. His long tail was swishing this way and that. You see, Papa, I said, He's watching me right now, just waiting for me to set my traps. Papa walked off toward the barn. I heard him laughing fit to kill. It finally got too tough for Sammy. He left home. Oh, he came in once in a while, all long and lean looking, but he never was the same friendly cat anymore. He was nervous and wouldn't let anyone pet him. He would gobble down his milk and then scoop for the timber. Once I decided to make friends with him because I felt bad about catching him in my traps. I reached out my hand to rub his back. He swelled up like a, like a sitting hen. His eyeballs got all green and he growled way down deep. He spat at me and drew back his paw like he was gonna knock my head off. I decided I'd better just leave him alone. In no time at all, I had cleaned out the rats. Then something bad happened. I caught one of mama's prize hens. I got one of those young man peach tree switchins over that. You know what that is. Made him go get his own switch from the peach tree and they did a little whooping on his rear end. Papa told me to go down into the cane breaks back of our fields and trap. This opened up all kinds of new wonders. I caught opossums, skunks, rabbits, and squirrels. Papa showed me how to skin my game. In neat little rows, I tacked the hides on the smokehouse wall. I'd stand for hours and admire my magnificent trophies. There was only one thing wrong. I didn't have a big coon skin to add to my collection. I couldn't trap old Mr. Ringtail. He was too smart for me. He'd steal the bait from the traps, spring the triggers, and sometimes even turn them over. Once, I found a small stick standing upright in one of my traps. I showed it to Papa. He laughed and said the stick must have fallen from a tree. It made no difference what Papa said. I was firmly convinced that a smart old coon had deliberately poked that stick in my trap. The traps helped my dog wanting considerably, but like a new toy, the newness worn off. And I was right back where I started from, only this time it was worse, much worse. I had been exposed to the feel of wildlife. I started pestering Mama again. She said, oh no, not that again. I thought you'd be satisfied with the traps. No, Billy, I don't wanna hear any more about those hounds. I knew Mama meant what she said. This broke my heart. I decided I'd leave home. I sneaked out a quart jar of peaches, some cold cornbread, and a few onions and started up the hollow back of our house. I had it all figured out. I'd go away off to some big town, get a hundred dogs, and bring them all back with me. I made it all right until I heard a timber wolf howl. This stopped my home leaving. When the hunting season opened that fall, something happened that was almost more than I could stand. I was lying in bed one night trying to figure out a way I could get some dogs when I heard the deep baying of a coon hound. I got up and opened my window. It came again. The deep voice rang loud and clear in the frosty night. Now and then I could hear the hunter whooping to him. The hound hunted all night. He quit when the rooster started crowing at daybreak. The hunter and the hound weren't the only ones awake that night. I stayed up and listened to them until the last tones of the hound's voice died away in the daylight hours. That morning, I was determined to have some hounds. 
I went again to Mama. This time I tried bribery. I told her if she'd get me a hunting dog, I'd save the money I earned from my furs and buy her a new dress and a box full of pretty hats. That time I saw tears in her eyes. It made me feel all empty inside and I cried a little too. By the time she was through kissing me and talking to me, I was sure I didn't need any dogs at all. I couldn't stand to see Mama cry. The next night, I heard the hound again. I tried to cover my head with a pillow to shut out the sound. It was no use. His voice seemed to bore its way through the pillow and ring in my ears. I had to get up and again go to the window. I'm sure if that coon hunter had known that he was slowly killing a 10-year-old boy, he would have put a muzzle on his hound. Sleep was out of the question. Even on nights when I couldn't hear the hound, I couldn't sleep. I was afraid if I did, he would come and I would miss hearing him. By the time hunting season was over, I was a nervous wreck. My eyes were bloodshot and red. I had lost weight and was as thin as a beanpole. Mama checked me over. She looked at my tongue and turned back one of my eyelids. If I didn't know better, she said, I'd swear you weren't sleeping well, are you? Why, Mama, I said, I go to bed, don't I? What does a boy go to bed for if it isn't to sleep? By the little wrinkles that bunched up on her forehead, I could tell that Mama wasn't satisfied. Papa came in during one of those inspections. Mama told him she was worried about my health. Ah, he said, there's nothing wrong with him. It's just because he's been all cooped up all winter. A boy needs sunshine and exercise. He's almost 11 now, and I'm going to let him help me in the fields this summer. That will put the muscles on it, back on him. I thought this was wonderful. I'd finally grown up to be a man. I was going to help Papa with the farm. Well, that is it, Larson Heights. Have a wonderful evening, and I will see you again tomorrow evening for chapter three of Where the Red Fern Grows. Good night.